Jonah a little bit. And my title is Jonah had a problem. Had problems. How many of you have ever had problems? How many figure you're gonna have some problems tomorrow? And maybe even the next day and the next day. We had an interesting trip. We we took our motor home out to the uh, campground. And we got out there Monday and got everything set up and turned the air conditioners on, everything was working good. But the next day it got really hot. Well, air conditioners on top of your motor home, they make water. And water runs off the side. So I'm always checking to make sure my water's coming off the side. It was doing good. Well, I noticed the second day we were there, the door was open a lot, so I started leaking water on the inside. And it was coming from my air conditioner, so I had to put a drip pan down. Never done that before. And I thought, okay, the door's been open, the compressor can't cut off, it's trying to work hard. And so that, that lasted a full day, but then that night, my back would started doing that. And I'm saying, what's going on here? So we kind of got up to check everything. It was making work, but it looked like a little blockage up in there. So we dealt with that all week. So Thursday, we're on our way home. You want to talk about problems? We're on our way home. Well, no, Wednesday, Kenny's driving my golf cart. Oh, he's driving the golf cart everywhere, all around, and he thinks he's Mr. King Kong. He becomes the Uber driver of the camp. <laughs> and, and, and Gary's golf cart was out there. Well, Kenny, about 1 o'clock, brought it back and just parked it. So she and I thought we was going to go down to the Red Hall for the kids who were getting ready to do their uh, vacation Bible school for the younger ones. And I get the golf cart, put it in reverse, and it moved about two feet and stopped. He tore my golf cart up. <laughs> he didn't really. So Thursday morning, we're ready to go home. I'm excited. I'll be home shortly, you know. She said, go get the sheriff's shoes and bring them and lock the door. I didn't know she didn't have her keys. And I didn't have my keys, so it's just as much me as any, you know, I should have my keys on me. So we locked the motor home. So we had to get somebody to come out. Linda, I didn't even think about calling my insurance. Linda just called her insurance. And they came out. And in two seconds, they got, and I locked it. I said, okay, so the day can get better. So all the way home, I'm almost, I'm at 66th Street. No, Tyrone, I turned on 66, we turned on 26th Avenue. Right before I turned on 26th Avenue, I lost power steering. My ABS brakes went out. A battery light came on. And I had heard a little whisper earlier, and I thought, well, that's that truck beside me. My serpentine belt broke. So I got to get home. I got about a mile to go. So I get about a, half, about a block and a half away. My temperature gauge goes, sleep. So, but we made it home. No damage, no nothing. And I thought about it. And I wanted to get angry, but I couldn't get angry. You know why I couldn't get angry? Because God blessed me that it happened there and not down the road somewhere else. God blessed me my golf cart broke there. I could get it home easy. I mean, Gary pushed it up on a trailer. And, 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 and everything that happens, we we're always able to take care of it. We have problems in our lives, and we deal with problems, but it's how we handle the problems that's in our lives. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's see this what Jonah did. And Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comforts of the Scripture might have hope. How often does God put people across our path that we don't like? Oh. Can I read that again? Because I want everybody to hear that. I like that one. How often does God put people across our path that we don't like? Have you ever wondered why? It could be a boss, a co-worker, a former friend, a neighbor, a family member, and even a brother or sister in Christ, or anyone else we feel animosity to. The reason for these people entering your life is because God is conforming you to be the image of Christ, teaching you to love even your enemies so that He, so you can be used by Him to be a vessel of compassion. Now, I know that was a whole lot to get hold of right there. But think about it. God allows these things to happen in our lives so that we can learn from that, so that we can grow. Matthew, the fifth chapter, the 44th through the 47th verse, I'll just read from up here. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Wow. Can everybody say that? Love your enemies? Bless them that curse you. Oh, that's a tough one, ain't it? That's strong words. Think about this. There's two little words there. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate 
you and pray for them which despisely use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is, is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if we salute your brethren only, what do ye, what do ye, ye more than others do not even the publicans so? So when I begin to look at this, this particular passage of Scripture, it was telling me, i got to love people that I don't like. Yeah, me too. Now, I might not like somebody's ways, and I might not like the way somebody does things, and I might not hang out with them, but i better love them because they've got a soul. Amen? Yeah. And that's what the Word is telling us to do, that we have got to love. And if we can just love, that's, that's the key of all things. Did I just lose the sound? Okay, okay, thank you. God is teaching us love. But listen to this. If we don't love people who curse us, hate us, use us, and persecute us, then we're no better than any non-Christian. Amen. Uh-oh. Can I, can I read that again? If we don't love people who curse us, hate us, use us, and persecute us, then we are no better than any non-Christian. If we hate or dislike anyone, Anyone can we really claim to be children of God? Wow. God brings these people into our lives for spiritual benefit and growth. In other words, we're going to grow because we're learning to love the unlovable. Amen? You might not like everybody, but you got to love them. How many of you ever went to work and just didn't want to be around your boss? You don't have to raise your hand. There might be some bosses around. I love that one. I ain't going over there. But, but you got to love them. You gotta love and respect them for who they are. Amen. And respect for what they're doing. But it's hard to love somebody that don't agree with you. <laughs> you see, in my mind, I got this thing figured out. Uh -huh. But I understand this mind is like the old computers that first come out and had the green screens. <laughs> How many remember the green screens? <laughs> da -da 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 -da. The green screens, you can't type too fast. I remember when I first got a computer. It was a green screen computer. Amen. And it didn't even have spell check on it. <laughs> and I remember going to seminary and I was sitting up at night and I was just typing thesis and typing all this here. Well, that's kind of where my mind is obsolete sometimes. Because <laughs> it didn't take long for the great higher tech computers and the higher tech. So I've got to learn to love people that I don't like. And I've got to respect them. And I've got to pray for them. Now listen to this. God brings these people in our lives for spiritual benefit and growth. I'm going to give you something here in just a minute. So don't miss it. And we do not realize it. Realize it. If we will obey God's will, it will be for our benefits and our enemies also. God is teaching us love. The Lord tells us how to love our enemies. We are to bless them, which is speaking good things to them. We are to do good to them. Most important, we are to pray for them. I think one of the hardest things I had when I started pastoring was everybody didn't like me. And that was hard for me because I thought everybody was supposed to like me. Especially Christians. I thought all Christians were supposed to love me no matter what. And I found out they didn't. Our first couple of years, well not our first year, that was pretty good, but our second year, I took a beating that year. She and I both took a beating that year. And, and I, had to, I had to grow up and say, you know what? I have to come to the understanding that everybody doesn't agree with me. But I'm going to love them for who they are, and that's okay. And if they don't understand me and they don't agree with me, that's all right too. And if I'm in error, I want to be corrected. How many likes being corrected? Oh, yeah. Go on, raise your hand if you will. <laughs> if anybody raise your hand, nobody wants to be corrected. Because we got it figured out. Well, there's a story in the Bible about a man named John. And I think it's kind of an interesting story, because I want to take it a different way that we probably preached it before. Jonah was wrong in what he did. The story of Jonah and the fish, or maybe a whale, told in the book of Jonah and the Bible, tells the prophet Jonah, I'm not going to read the scripture for this, you can read the book, it's only, what, 10 chapters or something like that, it's not very many chapters. But anyway, the Bible tells us the prophet Jonah or deal when God commanded him to go to Nineveh and preach the word for God to repent, for them to repent or be destroyed. Now, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Now, probably Nineveh is where Iraq is at today. 
to know to know where Iraq is because the Euphrates rivers and all that that area is where Nineveh was at. So let's look at this story here. It's an interesting story. The Assyrians was heartless, cruel, and evil people. They were the great enemy of Israel, and we'll find out they held Israel in captivity at times. Jonah did not want to go to them because he did not want them to repent. Jonah did not want God to have mercy and compassion on such people, so he fled the opposite direction, getting on board of the ship to escape from doing God's will. So here, look at this story. God said, Jonah, I got some people over there. I know you might not like them, but I want you to go preach to them. Either they repent or I'm going to destroy them. Jonah did not like those people. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh because he knew what God's mercy would do. Has God ever told you to go and speak to someone and pray for somebody that you didn't like and you didn't want to go? Whoa, come on now. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, but God wouldn't send you for no reason. He is sending you because he has mercy on them and they need help and they need what you have. You see, the Nineveh people, they, the people needed, the Syrian people needed exactly what Jonah had. But Jonah didn't like them people. He didn't care for them. He didn't want to go. So he did the very thing I think most of us would do. He got on a ship and went a different way. Now, we know the story. And some people say it's an allegory. An allegory is a story, but it's not. It's biblical. It's in the Bible. And it's, this, it happened. From inside the fish, John prayed to the Lord his God. He said, this is what John said. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Now think about that. He was saying, I am in desperate need right now. And he said, I cried out to the Lord and he answered me. Now think about this. From the depths of the grave, I call for help and you listen to my cry. Those who cling to wor uh, worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. In other words, if we're, if we're calling on somebody else instead of God, we're never going to get the help we need. Amen. Jonah, in, in, in the belly of that big fish, whether it was a whale, probably was a whale, but in that belly of that big fish, he cried out to the Lord, and God heard him. Don't you think God can hear you today no matter where you're at? No matter what you're going through, it doesn't matter how bad things seem to be, God can hear you today. Now let's stay with us a little bit. Jonah decided when he was in the belly of the well, he said, I'm going to repent and do what God told me to do. So Jonah does what God wants. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He said, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of God and went to Nineveh. Now, for him to do that, he had to repent of the way he was thinking before. Before God can use us sometimes, folks, we got to repent for the things that we have harbored up in our lives or in our minds. You hear what I'm, you understand what I'm saying? Because God wants us to do something. We don't want to do it, so we cry out, why me, God? Let somebody else do it. No, God called on you to do it, and he wants you to do it. That's hard, I know, but it's great. And when, we, and when we begin to follow that direction, we have to repent for being disobedient to God. So Jonah had to repent. Now I hope none of you get thrown to a bed of a well or a big fish. I, I, I preached one time that Jonah got thrown into it. It was in a bed of a well. Somebody said to me, how do you know it was a well? I said, well, I don't. So I said, I put fish or a well. Didn't taste. <laughs> Didn't taste. Somebody went and made it with me. I know Jew fish is big too. I don't know. But anyway, then the word of the Lord went, came to Jonah a second time. So go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Jonah did what God wanted him to do. Keep that in the back of your mind. But we will see later that Jonah was not happy about it. He was not happy about it, but he did because he knew he had to do what God told him to do. There might be times in our life where doing God's will interferes with our wants. You see, I have a lot of wants in my life, and a lot of things I want to do, but it's not necessary that I do those things. But when God calls me to do something, I better follow the leading of God. See, Jonah just wanted, he went. But it wasn't his will. He went because God told him to go. And sometimes 
We just got to get up and go. Amen? Amen. Have, have you ever had God just speak to you out of the blue? Tell you, I want, I want you to do this for me. Have you ever, ever had that happen? No? Okay. I see a head moving here. But when God speaks to me, I move. How do I know it's God speaking to me? That's the next question people ask. Well, how do you know that's God? Or maybe that's just you. I know it's God because I know who lives in me. You see, I've been serving God a long time. I know His voice. I know when He speaks because I, I, I listen for Him. And there's a lot of times there's a real quiet, quiet voice speaking to me, but I know it's God. And there's sometimes it's like, Larry! <laughs> I, I got to share this with you. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of a comical. I'm, I'm sitting in the house, and she was back in the back. We don't watch the same thing on TV. I watch the news and she watched crafts. And I heard a man's voice speak out. In my mind, I said, who's that? I got up, walked all around the house, I didn't see anybody. And I knew then that God was speaking to me and began to talk to me about some things and began to share some things to me personally. And, 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 but see, I know when God's speaking. And I think it's important that we know when God's speaking to us. So, so Jonah went. It, 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 it interfered with what he wanted. It was more safer for him to go to Spain to preach than it was to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is a very large city. A, a visit required three days to go through the whole city. On the first day Jonah started in the city, he proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, here's the part Jonah did not like. The Ninevites believed God. In other words, you got 40 days, repent, or I'm going to destroy the city. They believed in God. And this, this kind of upset John just a little bit because that, I don't think that's kind of what he wanted to hear. The Ninevite believed God. They had never listened to a prophet of God before. Perhaps no other prophet preached to them the same reason John did not want to preach to them because they were scared of them. They declared a fast. Now think about that. The city declared a fast. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Now look what happens when God comes on the scene, when we're obedient to God. Not, not just one person got touched, but a whole city repented. And they, and, they, and they took off their clothes and put on the sackcloth. When I looked at the sackcloth, what it was, it was kind of like a, a Kroger sack bag or something like that. They cut holes on and put it on like they had nothing. And they, and they called a fast because they knew and they believed in God. Now think about that. Isn't that amazing? Then the king issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man or beast Herd or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let any man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. You see, the king got it. The king understood it. We got to change our ways or we're going to be destroyed. God is not happy with us. He's going to destroy us. So the king got it. You know what I think that God is telling this country today? It is time we get it together and quit playing around and become the body of Christ that God has called us to be. And we got to start loving one, one another. I think that's what God's telling us. And I think about when this country became a nation, they fought so hard for this freedom that we're about to celebrate. Men and women today are still giving their life for freedom. Wow. The king got it. This is what the king went ahead and said. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger that we will not perish. Now think about that. So we will not perish. So when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, watch this. He had compassion on them. Amen. Wow. Isn't that amazing? How many of you remember when you were in sin? Come on, be honest. How many of you remember? You were a heathen, weren't you? Just like me. God was a heathen. That was a bigger one, but I was one. <laughs> I was more caught up in the world than when I was caught up in anything else in life. It was about me. Now, how many of you ever just were going to take care of you? But you know what? When Jesus came in my life, you know what he did? He had compassion on me. 
He forgave me of those things that I did in my past. Hallelujah. Uh, yeah, I like that. He forgave me. And He gave me a brand new life. Am I perfect? By no means. No. But I'm striving for perfection. I'm trying to get better every day in my life. You would not have liked me back in my old days. You wouldn't have liked me at all in my old days. I'll just be honest with you. We were heathens. We were crazy. We were mean. We didn't care. We had no hope. We had no peace. But when Jesus came in my life, He took all that stuff and threw it away and gave me hope. Amen. And I thank God for that hope that I have today. You see, He did the same thing to the people in Nineveh. He gave them hope. He had compassion upon them. He had mercy upon them. And he gave them an opportunity. But I want you to listen to what happened. Because I think this is important. But we need to get it. Because I think we see this today too. Maybe not in this broad of a sense, but we see. Let me find out where I was at. But Jonah was angry. He was very angry because God had compassion. And, and decided not to destroy Nineveh. But John was greatly pleased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? Now think about this. This is why I was so quick to flee to Tars. Because I knew because of your mercy, you would forgive them. That's why I went to Tars. I didn't want you to forgive them. Wow. Now think about that. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sinning calamity. Now, oh Lord, take away my life. Now look, look how bad he got. How mad he got about this thing. He said, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Now, now think about it. He got mad because God saved people? Now think about that. That's where he got. He went and preached because he knew that's what God wanted him to do. He didn't want to get back in the belly of a fish again. Or maybe something yet worse. So he went. And he proclaimed. And the Spirit of God touched people. But he was so angry that he said, Just let me die. But the Lord replied to him, Have you any right to be angry? Have you any right to be upset because I blessed somebody? Have you any right to be angry because I saved this city? Could you imagine if God came into and the Spirit of God just moved on all of us that here today? And we went out through Kansas City and St. Petersburg and this whole town got saved for the kingdom of God. I couldn't get mad about that, could you? But some people would. Because there are certain people people don't like. We better love everybody. And we better pray for everybody. Amen? Because my God is a God of mercy and compassion. I wasn't no angel. And I'm still not an angel. I'm trying to grow some wings, but I ain't got there yet. But God loved me so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross that I might have life. And I can have that same compassion for souls as He had for me. So, let's talk about Jonah was angry again. Very angry. Jonah goes to the east of the city and set up a camp. He builds a shelter and God provides a vine to cover the shelter. So Jonah would be comfortable in the shade. Jonah was waiting for instruction. He still wanted to see God destroy the city. But it did not happen. To teach Jonah a lesson, listen to this. God calls a worm to attack the vine and kill it. Then a hot, dry wind was sent upon Jonah and he suffered greatly. And here he wanted to die again. I can understand the heat last week. I was hoping for some AC somewhere. It was so hot. But he got, but he got so angry. The shade that he had, a warm came and killed it. And then God sent this, 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 this hot, dry wind, and it just made it miserable for him. So Jonah was angry, very angry, very angry again. He just gets very angry sometimes. Don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to figure out. I got angry before and I can't figure out what I got mad about. Anybody ever done that or is that just me? It ain't just me, is it? No. God, good. Thank you, Jesus. But here he was. He was so angry again. 
Jonah complained. Now, this is what he complained about now. Jonah, and you got to remember, God took him out of the belly of this fish. He did what God wanted. The whole city got saved. He got angry about that. Then God gave him shade. He got angry about that. So God said, if you don't want it, I'll just take it away from you. You know, sometimes God wants to bless us because we don't open up and receive blessings. We lose them. Hmm. Jonah complained that God killed his plant. But God said to Jonah, do you have the right to be angry about the wine? This is what Jonah said. I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. That he was angry enough to die because God saved Nineveh. Now all of a sudden he's angry enough to die because the wine got destroyed. What we call that in a, a clinical setting? He messed up. <laughs> Some would call it bipolar. One extreme to another. Some would call it something else. But this guy wasn't getting it in my mind. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or you even make it grow. grow. He said, here you're worried about this vine, but you had nothing to do with it. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than a hundred, listen to this, more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from the left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? You know what God was doing? He was expressing his love and care for the people. He loves St. Petersburg. He loves Kennedy City. He loves his whole state of Florida. He loves every person in this United States of America. He loves them in Canada. He loves them in South America. He loves them overseas. He loves everybody in the whole world. And we got to preach this gospel to let people know that God is still a compassionate, loving God. Amen. He loves you. And He will bless us. Isn't that amazing? Well, let's look at a lesson that was learned. Through this experience, God was just not working on the people of Nineveh. He was also teaching Jonah a lesson about true love and compassion. God wants us to be a vessel of His compassion. That He might, that He can use it to reach the lost and hurting world. The people that we don't like, now don't you listen to this. The people that we don't like are probably the people are hurting the most inside. Who are we to judge that they don't deserve the love of God? To touch their hearts. The Christian life seems to be a series of lessons about how bad we can be and how great God's mercy and compassion is. Another lesson learned. We must never forget that we're not in war with people. Can I say that again? We are not in war with people. We are in war with Satan. Amen? Amen. The people that we consider our enemies are just prisoners of war taken captivity <laughs> by Satan. Let's look at Ephesians, the 6th chapter, 12th verse, the King James Version. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, the, the, the power of God, which is the power of love, can turn an enemy into the best friend. Showing love to an enemy pleases God and proves that we have a great spiritual maturity. This is what I learned from the lesson with Jonah. Is that God can save whoever he wanted to save. Now, my pastor, when we, before we started pastoring, he did not like me. He didn't like me at all. To be honest with you, I didn't have a whole lot of love for him. And I had to repent he was hard on me. He told me one time, he said, I know where you came from. Well, he didn't know me before I got saved, but he had heard the stories and all that. And he said, I just don't know if you can ever make it as a pastor. And we went back and forth and back and forth. And so, I was sent forth to be a minister. He, he did not want me to receive my license as a lay minister. And the overseer just went ahead and gave him my license. And when I was talked to about pastoring, I didn't know this, but he went to the overseer and said, he don't need a pastor, he can never make it. He won't make it. And this man's mouth was on me like, oh, get out, because I wasn't good enough. I was from a little town called Samoset, which was a heathenist town, crazy people. And even when she was best friend found out she was dating me, she knew me, she cried. That's scary. She cried, but you don't know him, he's crazy. 
It's all because her dad one day was out shooting BB guns in our backyard, and her dad came out there and started messing with us. I think we shot him. I think we threw tomatoes at him or something. I don't remember. Which was the wrong thing to do. Nobody do that. But you know what God did? He took me. He molded me. And he made me the man he wanted me to be. And in the beginning, I wanted to be like this preacher. I wanted to be like that preacher. And I have to tell you this. When Gary would come and preach for us, I said, I wish I could preach as good as him. He'd come in, he had his all swinged up and doing his own thing, you know. I said, we've got it, pray, we've got it. Then one day God spoke to me and he said this. Gary, that was years ago. This was your accident and all that stuff, but let me tell you something. The man had that Jimmy Swagger sound and a younger man was there. He had, he just walked by the way, he had something. I said, I like that. Hey, we'll get blessed to by the 30th to his brother that preached here before. Yes. Jake, he'll be here that day to preach for us. We really enjoy Jake. Jake's great. But anyway, let me get back to my story. So, God, God gave me a church, and we went, and the first year, God, we were blessed. We were blessed. The church grew. We built a brand new building, and one year, never got to preach in it. And God began to bless. Second year was like, whoa, did I make a mistake? But then after that, I just have enjoyed what God has done for us. Well, Sheila and I were made camp directors over camp. And I think we served about six years, I'm not real sure, six or seven years as camp directors. And so I asked this pastor to work in a camp with me. He came to work, and we got there one day, one night, we were sitting there talking. I said, and I will call his name as a pastor. I want to apologize to you. He said, okay. I said, I know I was hard on you. I'm asking for your forgiveness. He said, well, it's about time. <laughs> And I'm saying, don't you want to say something to me? <laughs> he never said a word to me. <laughs> but you know what? I forgave him. He lost his pastor position. He can't. He just didn't function as a pastor. And that's sad. There's no hearts there. And I pray for him. That right last time I talked to him, he said, I just, all I want is to dig a small church and just dig it out. I said, go find you one and dig it out. But he struggles. And he still struggles today. And I pray for him every day. But he could have said, can you forgive me? But he didn't go there. But anyway, that was good enough. <laughs> but you know what God does? God takes the people that you think that can't make it. And they're the ones he used. Let me finish this up real quick. Lesson learned again. We must all remember that as a citizen of heaven, we are ambassadors sin represents the kingdom and our king Jesus Christ only by compassion and love can we re represent the God of love the God of compassion we show love even to our enemies by doing good to them by blessing them we just say good things to them and say good things about them behind their back and speaking blessings and not cursing Proverbs 18 21 Tells us death and life are in the power of the tongues, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Another lesson I learned. The most important way we show love is through prayer. This is where spiritual battles are fought and won. I have men and women I know I can call in this church when I need something to be prayed about, and I know they're praying. Because I can feel God touching people because I know they're praying. And I want to tell you, prayer warriors, I appreciate you. I love you. We need you. And we need more to step up and pray with us. Doing all these things because the compassion of God to flow through our hearts as a river of life. It would change our enemy's life, and even if they're not affected, it would definitely change our life, which is God's plan anyway. So let's remember the final thing that Jesus taught. In Matthew 5, 44, 47, but I say to you, as we read earlier, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for them who spitefully use and persecute you. Matthew 5 and 9 said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I hope you take the story of Jonah to heart. I think it's a great story that we can look at if we look at it in the right ways. Jonah wanted to go to a safe place. He didn't want to go to a place that could be rough. He wanted to go to a safe place. The re if y'all would come on up, if you will. The Redentists are not here today. But I told you before about the young man that picked up on the side of the street. He was just sitting on the street. 
His mother had just put him there and said she'd be back and she never came back to get him. They picked him up. They brought him home. They fed him. They clothed him. They got hold of the officials and told the officials they would just keep him for a while. And they introduced him to a church. He got involved in the church and actually moved in with the pastor and, and their family. And today he has the largest Sunday school in America, New York City. His name is Billy Wilson. Billy Wilson, he made cut with a knife and was shot. His drivers have been murdered on their buses. But they still go back into that city, into that place. And they're still trying to teach and preach the Word of God. He's got a book out, by the way. I read it, and I think she was reading it now. It's an amazing life to see what this, this man and all the people that work with him, what they've been through. Through all the hurt and the pain and how people come up against them, he's still about winning the loss for Jesus. You see, he's willing to go somewhere that nobody wanted to go. Because Harlem is a tough area. His church is at the center of Harlem. And he goes in there and he preaches and teaches every Sunday about the goodness of God. If I understand correctly, they've got over 5,000 kids in their Sunday school. Or something like that or more. Tremendous amount of children. He, tra he travels, he preaches to raise more money to bring it back just to help win these kids. You know what happened? Somebody seen this kid sitting on the side of the road. Most people went by him and left him. But Dave and Florida Dennis, they picked him up. In their book he wrote, he puts their name in there. And Dave, all his life, has given his love to the Lord. And now he's sick. He's really sick. We need to pray for Dave. And he's going through a lot. But I, I just want you to know that when somebody stepped up, they stepped up. Look what he did. Changing the life of, of thousands and thousands of young people. God might be calling us to do something. Are we ready to do what God calls us to do? If y'all would lead us into a song. If you would stand with us, just for a few moments. <laughs>